Okay, I'm the 83 Theo Karat, back with you for another one. Uh, I'm not going to prattle on at this point because all the information's in the video I put together. Um, so I'm moving straight in. I'll see you at the end. Uh, this is the third and final one. We finally got to the end of it. So good luck getting there. I wonder what our kind of tipping point in Australia is going to be when people are going to start burning stuff. Um, I look forward to it. Yes, so kicking off where we left uh, episode two. We're happily burning things and taking joy in it. Uh, if you didn't watch part one and two of this series, it might be worth going back and have a look. This is an in-depth look at uh, the Q&A program on ABC Television, Australia's national taxpayer-funded broadcaster, dated 3rd of November 2019. We have a feminist panel um, for anyone who did come in late, essentially just bagging on white society because apparently it's the evil of all evils i'm going to be trying to get through 20 minutes of the show with this one to finish it off in this uh third part so i will shut up now and let's go and listen to the sweet young things on the panel shall we um <laughs> well Harry's yeah. question was when you know is when is it better off than assertiveness and strong arguments and modeling the but, behavior you expect of others you know this shouldn't have been a hard one not one of them answered the right way. Not one of them answered never. Murray was dead right in asking this question, and I'm pretty sure Murray knew what the answer was going to be. I don't think Murray saw the red-headed um, twat coming up and telling him that she was being raped and murdered all the time, and I think he answered the wrong way to that. He should have just said, have you been? Because no, she hasn't been, but... Um, other than that, he was dead right in asking this question. And any of you could have said never, and not one of you did. You all defended a violent stance, each and every one of you. I think I that bloody quote by appealing to your oppressor. Oh, 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 Assata Shakur. Assata Shakur. It's throughout history, no one has ever gotten their right or their freedom by appealing to the moral sense of their oppressor. I don't... It's, so, it's so fascinating it is... for me that men constantly ask, oh, you don't want to become like us. You know, okay. so I, don't use violence. Let's move to finish so I'm point. thinking about, I'm, you know, in a colony, we live in a colony. Like, I cannot, we've tried for 230 plus years to appeal to the colonisers' morality, which just doesn't seem to exist. Oh, pick me, pick me. I know everything. Um, I probably have heard of this author, and I probably don't give a shit. But the quote from this author is apparently this wisdom. The oppressed never got their rights or freedoms by appealing to the moral sense of their oppressor. I'm guessing a socialist writer, because they do love a good bloodbath, and this would promote a bloodbath. But most of the um, European and European colonial world did away with slavery without needing a bloodbath. White people just found it in their moral code unappealing to keep other people as slaves. And laws were changed and the world became a better place, didn't it? Except the Arab world, where this extremely privileged, from an extremely privileged background, red-headed, freaky clown woman comes from. Because there, they still do have slaves. They have never abolished slavery. Now, after she made this about men, and um, made it synonymous with violence, uh, they pulled her up a bit, and I'm, I'm really pissed at that they should have let her dig a hole even deeper but the woman who followed did her job digging the hole as well when the first thing she claims is australia is a colony i personally think we passed the point of being a colony some time ago how was it that this woman put it australia or whatever um yes love we call it australia it has been a nation under that name for quite some time now the idea that as a colony we have colonizers morality can be called into question very easily because we have a minister for indigenous affairs the same as we have one for women's affairs we don't have one for a white fellow affairs or for men but we do have one for indigenous affairs it doesn't take anything to learn that that website has an entire section on funding specifically for aboriginal people in fact a google search that led me to this the first page was just organisations that had funding specifically for Aboriginal people. And for the record, in this nation, and it has been shown many times, if you tried to set up funding for men, 
you'd be lynched. In fact, set up any sort of white fella funding and you'd be called a racist and shot. And still, all the money we throw at Aboriginal problems to try and stem our white guilt shows that we have no morality. We have a colonizer's morality, which is as good as no morality. Now, I'd love to raise this question with this woman. Is she a welfare dependent? Because she's apparently a writer, and I would bet my bottom dollar that she gets her money through government funding, or at least a good part of it. Her kickoff, her university education, was probably funded to a large degree through some sort of Aboriginal assistance program. Certainly she's not intelligent enough to have made it on her own. You can tell that from this program. But I bet she full well knows of all these grants and payments that are available. There is no such site for white people. There is for immigrants, but there are none for the colonizers. You see, white guilt is a real thing, a very real, very racist thing. They can't see people's problems beyond their ability to tick the box that says Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander at the bottom of all government documents and a hell of a lot of the private sector documents you'll ever see in this country. Now, some years back, I was working in arts in Queensland. I've worked in arts in Queensland and New South Wales, but I was working in arts in Queensland when the state government sent us out their new provisions for art funding. And stuck in that year's provisions, and probably not removed since, was a one-line paragraph that stated that 100% of arts funding in Queensland had to be prioritised for Aboriginal artwork. At that time, the Aboriginal art industry was worth $5 billion, but it still needed every cent of state government funding. And as a writer, that included you. I tell you what, I'd hate to have a colonizer's morality looking after me. What a terrible fucking thing it is. For the record, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'd love to shut the whole fucking system down on you. Because I think we've made you welfare dependent. I think we've made you the soppy milk sops that you represent on this show by giving you money and not making you responsible for it. I think we need to find a different way to be supportive without handing you cash. That's my moral stance. And while I've always been a classic liberal, and I believe welfare does serve a purpose, I do believe that in your case it has gone too far. For someone who's trying to cut this short, that was a five minute rant. I'm going to get the fuck on with this. I'll try and skip ahead somewhere. Um, <clears throat> so it's, I think violence, yeah, I think violence is okay. Because, like, we, if someone's trying to kill you, you know, there's no amount of, oh, but I'm really clever, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm really articulate. Um, no amount of that is going to save you. So I, yeah, it's I, a think tricky, it's really good, stuff. I think there's a really good stuff. For fuck's sake, I'm trying to get ahead. Nobody is trying to kill you. You have no reason for violence. If it was retaliation, I would agree. And where do you finish this? Let's burn stuff in Australia or something. There's a reason why I asked if you're a welfare dependent. Alright, the next question is from Stacey Otto. I want to know if we can change the legal system to better, change, uh, to better deal with domestic violence. Can domestic violence related charges be introduced instead of the stock standard unlawful assault and with this mandatory sentencing? The sentencing seems to be grossly inadequate for domestic related crimes. The answer is no. It's that simple. The answer is no. I bet your feminists don't come up with that, but it's no. The reason we call it domestic violence is because of the situation in which it occurs, not because of the nature of the crime. The crime is still the same if it occurs in any other situation. However, if you meant, should we crack down on women who are getting off lightly in domestic violence situations because we call this a gendered issue? Sure, I'm on side. It's time we treated both genders the same and gave them the same punishments for the same crimes. That's called equality. You wanted it? How about you try and actually live with it? And now let's see if the feminists have anything interesting or important to add to this topic. Uh, sorry, sorry, this isn't meant to be comedy, is it? I really should keep the jokes down. Because I know the feminists are going to walk over this, I'm just going to add this quick note. 
Domestic violence is not gendered. It is more accurately socioeconomic, where people low on the socioeconomic ladder and alcohol play far bigger parts than gender. It is also, as are all crimes, a repeat offender crime, which means it might not be a thousand people committing a thousand crimes. It is more likely to be five people committing 200 each. I think this was a joke. I think this whole bit was a joke. Because she's comparing our legal system and our police force to Brazil's. And she's saying that Brazil's police force betrayed women so badly that they created women's police stations. And that dropped the crime and increased reporting for um, women in Brazil. I have absolutely fucking no idea what that has to do with our system. Nothing at fucking all. And I don't see how that would improve our system, because our system already has female police officers who largely deal with uh, female victims. In fact, we've had a case fairly recently where a man spent four years in jail because the police cozied up to a witness. And not just the officer that she ended up marrying, but the entire bloody prosecution service. Even while she was being prosecuted for false claims. Maybe what we need is men's stations. Australia is not Brazil in the same way it is not Egypt. And again, they're talking about female victims. They're talking about female police stations. They're talking about women only. They're not talking about male victims. There is no room for male victims or boys who are victims. None at fucking all in these people's minds. Jess, they also brought in a crime in Argentina, I read perhaps in your book, I, I can't recall where I read it, um, a, a crime of femicide, which carries harsher penalties than homicide. That's right. Um, one of the questions that came in earlier talked about a king hit punch here is considered worse, uh, is, is, not, not consider, is, is, not, is considered worse than domestic violence and abuse in terms of the sentencing. Yeah. I mean, does changing that, one single change of that, would that make a difference? Whoa, back up there. Domestic violence is not the same as a king hit. Do you know why we don't compare a king hit to domestic violence? I know you're fucking stupid, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Because a king hit is a one-off random event which has been known to kill people, and it happens late at night outside nightclubs, generally by drunk people. Now, domestic violence, on the other hand, is a term which describes everything from killing someone in the home or related to you to yelling at them a little bit and having that yelling judged as violence. Can you see why the two might not be the same? You're really, really digging for this to be about murder, aren't you? Domestic violence in a feminist's eyes is just murder. Every woman, every instance, murder. Look, I don't know if it's just me, but I'm a bit concerned also that we're being compared to South American regimes. Does anyone else think that it's possible that South American regimes have got problems that we don't face? Well, the point is that actually what women and children have been telling us for the last 40 years since the refugees opened is that often the physical violence is not the worst part. And sometimes physical and sexual violence is not even present. It's about the perpetrator creating a believable threat of violence. And then through in, in some of the worst abuse that we, that we see, in coercive control, the actual violence is against the self, the sense of self. It's about just eroding and degrading that person to a point where they have no self-esteem left. When they are basically to survive, they need to make the perpetrator more powerful inside themselves than they are so that they can see the world through the perpetrator's eyes and second-guess their next move. Yeah, I finally got a bit to fast forward. Without meaning to, she's basically made my point for me that a king hit is a violent act and domestic violence can be a range of things, which don't necessarily end up with people being dead. But she takes it somewhere else. So let's go on. Now in Scotland, what they're doing at the moment, what they've done across the whole UK, but Scotland's really the gold standard, is that they've actually criminalised domestic abuse. And I can't wait to see all the cases that come forward in time of men being abused, nagged, financially held back or ruined by a woman who's an absolute bitch. Because I'd lay money on the fact that most domestic abuse is women. I know we still live in a time where we're gynocentric and men just don't like to report the women. And it's not about men wanting to look more manly. We just don't like to report women. We're protective of women. I know it. I'm gynocentric. I'm protective of my partners. What is it the AA people say? Knowing it is the first step to controlling it. But I can't wait for the time when this backfires and men realise they're being shat on from on high and that they actually have the high ground legally with this kind of legal system. How many eons of nagging wife jokes have there been for us to realise that women 
do these things. Well, payback's a bitch, and I think it's coming. Welcome to the world feminism created. So right now in Australia, domestic abuse is not a crime. Assault's a crime. Stalking is a crime, but most of what happens in these households is permissible. So installing GPS trackers, using spyware, you know, micro-regulating women's behaviour, insisting that what just happened in front of her didn't happen to the point where she feels like she's going insane. None of that is illegal. You know what? In Scotland now it is. Okay. And so the question is, you know, can, can the sentence seem to be grossly inadequate? You're saying to say, yes, it is, and what can be done differently? And you've got first experience of, of this. What's, what's your thoughts? Um, well, I think, and I looked at countries that have dealt with it well uh, relative to Australia. And again, I go back to this double speak, and you're absolutely right that we are and have leaders who speak in ways unwittingly or deliberately where they uh, message and give signals to men in terms of male behaviour. Um, they put their hand in the hand of and embrace the values of someone like Donald Trump. And, but how can we change it to make so, it better? So the countries who get it right and the environments that get it right have a strong commitment to human rights, mm. which we don't. That was an absolute flying in the face of fucking reality lie, and I'd love to see your evidence for that claim alongside gender equity and a commitment to economic and gender equity. Well, hang on, we're we talking Brazil at the moment. There's a few problems there in terms of human rights. Well, the, I'm not saying Brazil is the best one, but I'm talking about the, you know, the Netherlands and those sorts mm. of countries in Finland and the countries that have really uh, reduced in a consistent way uh, time and again, not who've gone from extraordinary abuses to then, you know, relatively get out. Mm. The countries who have consistently uh, addressed the issues of violence towards women and... And I find it problematic and disconcerting that we're saying, oh, well, you know, the gender equity conversation hasn't worked and we still have increased incidents of violence towards women what is it that we're getting wrong finally something worth getting my teeth into something worth replying to what we did wrong was let feminists be in charge of the message about domestic violence and they fucked it up by gendering it the woman at the far end from this one earlier said we finally should be learning something from the women and children in shelters but what she didn't say was what we should have learned is that violence is generational and these fucktards just don't get it millions of dollars in taxpayer money gets shoveled into these people's pockets and they can't work out the one thing that erin pizzi the woman who started the shelter movement knew violence is generational question answered mic drop i'm out of here nah really i'll finish this shit the things I do for fun. What we're getting wrong is the domestic. It's the attitude that gives legitimacy to the treatment of women. <laughs> So, and when we talk about the police, the police themselves are sometimes domestic abusers. I finally have something I can agree with the Mona Groner on. Um, yeah, there's enough female police officers that there probably are some abusers amongst them. Note the story I referenced earlier and is in the low bar, which shows that some women associated with police are indeed abusers. <laughs> And you look across the world, I mean, I'm glad there are positive examples, but the entire system is rigged. And so there's another legal specialist called Mary Ann Franks, who wrote a law article in which she says, we need optimal, viol optimal levels of violence, where men think twice before being violent to a woman. And she, a law professor, is saying that women need to practice justifiable violence against men's unjustifiable violence, and men need to be less unjustifiable violence against women. And there's the first sign that that person shouldn't be practicing law in any way, shape or form. But I think here that Mona is proposing that men who are violated by women also be allowed to use excessive violence in return. Because we live in a post-feminist age, and this is the age of equality, surely. And I don't believe this. I think this is what Mona is proposing. I would say she's wrong. Okay, this is the system. Okay, now to answer your question, I think we have to be really wary of having a personal response to an issue like domestic violence because, well, what's the aim? What are we trying to do? We want to stop violence happening. We want to stop the harm happening. So, what happens? We call the police, and you know, in an ideal, in this scenario, in an ideal world, there'll be there's a, you know, a minimum sentence of you know, a mandatory sentence of however long, I don't know how many years you're looking for. Um, but then what happens? You know, these largely men are going to extremely violent institutions, extremely violent. There's no chance of rehabilitation. They come out, and then what happens? So we can't. I think we need to really imagine. In summary, um, men are bad. Uh, we should put them away for, uh, unquestionably, it should be years um, for when they speak mean to women. That's a summary. That's all she said up to this point.
and the way that we're dealing with this harm because these are our, they are our brothers. They are our, not mm. black, I'm, you know, your brothers. They Why are they not black? Domestic violence is highest in Aboriginal communities. Why are they our brothers? Why aren't they your brothers? Are you being racist still? Sorry, rhetorical question. Stupid rhetorical question. There are, there are neighbours, there are teachers, there are police officers, there are politicians, this is everywhere. And what kind of, how do we want to work with them to get better? But if we just give our answer like the elderly is just to lock away the problem, which doesn't actually solve it, it just makes it worse. But what, there are people who, want, who do want to stay with their partners and want their partners to get better. But if our only answer is incarceration, then we do that. Basically, a list of occupations she thinks men dominate. Uh, the fact that she thinks they're all violent and they all need locking up. But she doesn't think that's a solution. Because prison might make them more violent. Questions, but just before we finish this one, is the answer not them to try and do, which is the current discussion in this country, try and make the court system a better protective of women and because it, but the family violence, you know, the family court is riddled with violence to make our police women more prevalent in that system so women feel more comfortable. Is that not the answer? And I thought the current investigation was into false claims of violence in the family court, but there you go. If the ABC host says it's true, and no, more female police officers is not the answer unless you want to assume that every man who enters is guilty. I know that's what the feminists are calling for, but it's not the case. And by focusing on women that way within the court system, you'd be telling any man who walked through the door that he was guilty before he'd even got in the courtroom. My mum was a police officer, so <laughs> no, I don't think more, it's a patriarchal institution, it's not gonna, it doesn't really, it doesn't do much. I think we finally have some insight into this woman. Her mother was a shit police officer and she thinks the rest of them are shit. Not only that, her mother may have just been an Aboriginal liaison officer, which is not a real police job anyway. But you know, you can claim your parent was a police officer if she was a liaison officer. Maybe that's why she thinks vigilantes and burning shit down are a better form of justice. She's a fucking idiot. I mean, her mother was useless at her job. And she doesn't want prisons, which means the only sort of uh, justice she wants to dish out is, what, maiming and killing people and burning their shit down. Because that'll be a better world for women. Because women are never the violators. They're never the ones going to be in trouble. But the other thing I just want to say is that when do you see carceral responses to social issues? Particularly... Aboriginal women, as we're saying, we've, there's been a huge increase in the amount of Aboriginal women that are incarcerated and women in general. It's higher than the rates of men that have gone up. So, what am I thinking? Yeah, let's lock them up. Who, who are the people that also get caught up? Welcome to the post feminist world where we've worked out where this woman's problems come from. More gins are ending up in jail because apparently we're no longer excusing them quite so much for the crimes they commit. And as to her question, the people who get tied up in the prison system are generally criminals. Unless, as we've covered earlier, they're falsely accused men. Mm. And there are also a lot of women who accident, well, you know, police misidentify them as yep. the perpetrator. Mm. Okay, uh, look, let's go to our next question because time will run out on us tonight. This one's from Nicole Lee. So, disabled women are twice as likely to be victims of violence and a third of disabled women will be uh, victims of domestic and family violence. Um, how can we increase awareness of disability gendered violence when we don't get invited to the discussions? This is a great question. This covers some really old feminist war ground. Being female is a disability, and that's why they get to gender disability discussions and why they need to be included in them, and they can write off disabled men. Yes. Well, the stats on this are shocking. The stats are shocking, and especially in situations where, you know, if women are reliant on their carers who are also their abusers, mm -hmm. there's very little choice that they feel like they can have. Um, Nicole, full disclosure, interviewed my book, and, uh, and she's one of the most fierce and brave advocates that I've ever met. Um, and what she said to me once really stuck with me is like, we are not vulnerable by virtue of being disabled. We are vulnerable because the state makes us vulnerable. We do not have to rely on men who abuse us to care for us. And that's really where it's at, right? You know, and you were talking, you know, when you bravely left your partner, if I may say, yeah. you know, it took them weeks to just let me know about the package that was available to you that would help you take a shower, would help you get your kids to school, that would enable you to stay separate from the man who had viciously abused you for years. And that was because these, all of these sectors, they operate in silos. And they don't speak to each other. And I think that disabled services are different from family violence services. Uh, yes, because wheelchair ramps are different to being pummeled. And you can be pummeled if you need a ramp or not. Oh, shit, my mistake, sorry. Violence is something that happens to women. 
female is a disability. Of course they're the same thing. Fuck out, I get that so wrong. And part of the answer to this, not just for disabled women, but for all women that are going through this. Is for these people to get together and collaborate instead of working at cost purposes or competing for clients or passing on like you from one service provider to the next in which you're basically just spending all your days trying to figure out what, how you're going to get the help that you need. I really don't have that much to add to that. I don't know how this woman thinks you run a government. I think she believes it should just be run for the benefit of women. I, I mean, disabled people. Synonymous, you know. Just can't ask you how, how you think. You can increase the awareness change. Oh, I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this opportunity. I'm really glad to be part of this feminism from a wheelchair let me speak but we did finally get to mention the unmentionable men. normally I wouldn't bother to mention it you know I mean it should just be a thing but it's been such a man hate fest this show that I thought it was worth digging out the one actual mention of the possibility that men are victims and that's it that's where it stopped that was all you're gonna get the rest of her spiel was basically just because I've got a wheelchair doesn't mean I don't know other things, consider me an expert in everything, I want to talk everywhere. That that was it. And a whole heap of feminist jargon. Still, credit where it's due. She's not as man hating as the rest of this bunch. I go to the disability sector and, and I talk about violence and, and people are really uncomfortable about it. I talk about violence in the family violence sector and people are really uncomfortable because I've got a disability. So I get sidelined in both sectors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think yeah. I make both sectors uncomfortable, yet both sectors need to be talking to each other if we want to even get close to dealing with it. I'm not sure as well for people to <laughs> Okay, fast forward in the next section because basically it's just everyone else jumping in trying to get their me too moment. I think when we talk about the sectors not relating to each other, we're talking about these different forms of oppression. I do think the sort of zooming way out answer is to address all these oppressions at once because when you chip away at the fear and ignorance that underlies any form of it you you do chip away i mean i think activism is intersectional also yes, and i think at the broadest level that is how the we can capitalize on all these movements happening in all these sectors together okay but i need to, you to prove that this is an institutional injustice not people feeling uncomfortable around other people or that government departments can't be run simultaneously doing every Everything at once and that sometimes people do get lost in the cracks that it's not because they're discriminating are you fighting mythical beasts and does it help anyone there are very real problems going unanswered in the world while you fight the patriarchy this question comes from Beth Kay thanks Fran uh, recently there's been a lot of discussion of toxic masculinity and its impacts on society uh, but my question for the panel is, aren't the constraints of femininity and masculinity toxic in themselves? And what does positive masculinity look like? Mona? And yet, when I talk about imagining violence against men, and clearly the only sort she can accept. Oh my God, Mona wants to kill men, and I'm just asking you to imagine a scenario that is a deadly reality for women everywhere. I agree with you. Yes, the gender binary is long overdue. Let's get rid of it. Fuck the gender binary. Because who needs biological reality? It doesn't describe anything. Yes, but we are also talking about a society that socializes boys and men into believing that they are entitled to women's time, bodies, love, affection. Jealous women, Klingons. Those are the um, things we would call stalkers if they were male, but female stalkers are something much worse. They install themselves into your life and they just won't let go. That's why I call them Klingons. Then there's the nagging bitchy type women who think that once they've got you, you end and they begin. And while it's true some men do have jealousy and other things going on, it's more about not wanting to lose something you've obtained. 
that you never expected to get. For women, it is purely about getting what they want. You see, entitlement is actually a female thing. It is not a male thing. Most men go through life not expecting to get women. We would like women. We will try to get women, but we do not expect them. Expectation is a purely female thing. But as with all the feminist toolbox, things like the wage gap, you'll never fucking get rid of them no matter how much you can disprove them. These people are cultists. They have a doctrine. They will not change. So Mona, even though I joked about a mythical guy standing on the table in front of you face fucking you, the truth is no man's going to do it because no man has the expectation he is allowed to do it or could do it. So you'll have to fuck your own face or go back to the soy boy and get it done there. But you're not getting it done because a bloke expects it. In the United States, that has a direct impact into boys as young as 16 going into school and shooting to death half their class because the girl said no. So what would positive masculinity look like? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> Seriously, I couldn't have summed her position on men up any better. She's got no fucking idea. In fact, I don't think she's got any fucking idea about women. And there's women in this house who support that idea. It was a mic drop and walk away moment. But I better keep going. <laughs> Hannah, Hannah. Uh, positive masculinity is an empowered woman. <clears throat> <laughs> Well, at least she's not on her own with no fucking idea. On the other hand, maybe she does know. My wife walked past yesterday when I was producing this and asked if that was a man. Racism and teachers and, and um, will nurture attitudes of respect towards women. I, I, no, you can't play one of those. The positive masculinity does exist amongst men. It does exist. Like I see it. You know, I see it. Sometimes amongst my uncles, I see it. You know, my brother, for example. I think there, there are examples out there. You know, when, yeah, I, I just I want to live in a world where it's like, oh, well, men are crap, so whatever. I think it's reductionist to... I really would have played that bit, uh, and credit where it's due, she was trying to say that men have positive value, but her brain fried while trying to say it, and she just fucking rambled a bit. But she tried, and credit where it's due. There's something, sorry, full disclosure, I'm pregnant with twins, and my brain is absolutely <laughs> fried. No, no, but the point is you're pregnant with twins, and I don't know what they are, but they might be boys, therefore you've got to be thinking about positive no, masculinity. No, I, I have... I... Do you? Do you have to think about how much of a bigot you're going to be before your children are born? Because I have two sons, and I never once stopped to think about their masculinity. In fact, I didn't think about whether I was having sons or daughters, or their feminine. Seriously have been thinking about this. Congratulations. Tonight. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, what, oh, like, initially I was scared. I was like, what if I raise a cis straight man? <laughs> Like, what am I going to do? <laughs> um, but that's just, I think that's crap. I, I... <laughs> this thing that, this masculinity and femininity, mm. like, for, for me, they're things to be played with, that we can have fun with them, that they can be traps for a lot of people. I think particularly white kind of patriarchy and white patriarchal values traps people. But nope, you had to spoil it with your racist bigotry. You were almost on a winner there. You'd almost worked it out that men and women are different and there's nothing wrong with men in the same way there's nothing wrong with women. We're all equally capable of good and bad. And on the whole, we're good. I was with you when it was just blackfellas you were saying was okay because I'm quite happy for there to be okay blackfellas. I've had some great mates who were blackfellas. But then you had to bag on other races, didn't you? Because you're a racist. That's what you are. A racist. I mean, to some degree, you're a sexist too. But you are definitely a racist. Don't get me wrong, you've all shown your racism. The difference is you almost got it. It's very upsetting, it really is, that you were so damn close. Well, I kind of feel sorry for dudes. Like, Santa Candles are really beautiful. I brought my brother one the other day. And I'm like, man, this is out for like a million years because men aren't meant to do it. But I think, I don't know, I think the softness and the beauty and the positivity is there. I don't, yeah, anyway, I'm frankly just... I'm sorry, I can't have any Um, you don't need rescuing ever. Um, I think that positive masculinity looks like positive humanity. You know, there are so many people in my life I would accept that from. It sounds great. But from you, I don't. Because you seem to think service of humanity is service to women. 
you've made it damn clear that you have no idea what service to humanity is. Um, I think that, before, like imagine us talking about what does positive femininity look like? I don't know, when I, as I grew up, I didn't think about being a woman. I just felt, thought about being a person. This is a really, really good line of thought you're working with. But I'm waiting for the but. Um, unfortunately, sometimes as I grew older, I was reminded how very much I was a woman, especially when I was sexually harassed. And Hooray, at this point, we could still be talking about boys as well. I was also sexually harassed by women. You know how I know about Klingons? I was also stalked. In my school days, girls physically assaulted me. There was a couple of girls, they just took it upon themselves to think that they could hit me all the time. And I was raised not to retaliate. Still waiting for the butt. You know, that was like an imposition on what I basically felt was our fundamental humanity. Um, what does positive masculinity look like? It looks like getting back in touch with who you are as people and not trying to define yourself by being one or the other. I'm still seeing the positive in this, but I'm gonna enter the butt. But if it wasn't for feminists telling us how horrible we were all the time, maybe we guys could just get on with being positive humans. Still waiting for your butt. Not, and especially not trying to define yourself by not being a girl, because that's what toxic masculinity teaches us. It's like, you know, you are a man primarily by rejecting, you know, feminine features like compassion and understanding and talking and having best friends, you know. <laughs> For someone who apparently wrote a book on masculinity, you've got no fucking idea. Compassion, understanding, talking, friends, and in the bit that I'm about to fast forward, scented candles, which was a solution one of the other women came up with. I don't think you know what a woman is, let alone what a man is. You've defined women down to compassion, understanding, talking, friends, and scented candles. For fuck's sake. Do you think all women are alike? And I hate to blow your bubble on men, but we are compassionate. Look, we go into relationships where a sex drive is suppressed by somebody else's needs and wants. We're the first to run into fires and fall in buildings to save people. We'll dig animals out of floodwaters. It's not that we don't have compassion. It's that we are meant to rise above our emotional state. It's that we're meant to rise above our emotional state and act. You'd have us sitting beside the river crying, watching the animal drown rather than jumping in to save it. That's what you're saying. Talking. You came up with that one because you think the only way to talk is long emotional discussions with your girlfriends. Well, men can get away with relieving their stresses by just talking shit with one another. We don't fucking do it your way. And we don't need to do it your way. Understanding. Well, for a start, I've got more understanding of humanity than you have. I mean, this is just repeating the compassion thing again, isn't it? Because in order to have compassion, you have to have understanding. And we have that. We really do. You don't think we do because you're a cultist. And you and other cultists have just decided men are broken things. Friends. Yes, I've had friends. I've had really good friends. I've also moved on from said friends when the time has come. But my best friend is a woman. My very best friends are my partners. I don't know if you know anything about relationships and how they work, but being friends with your partners really helps. A relationship based purely in the physical is not going to be a great relationship. And I think listening to this list of what you think men don't have, that you don't have compassion or understanding. By your own standards, we could question whether you're actually a woman. So we've got one last question and we've all got to be very, very short with the answer. This one's from Timothy Moore. My question returns to ageing and celebrating the positive aspects of ageing. And in particular, um, one important thing about ageing is knowledge and knowledge transfer. We've spoken a lot tonight about the ne negative aspects of cultural transmission, white patriarchy, but can we flip that around and think about what positive feminist advice you have received from your elders? None. They've received none. The fact that they think there is a patriarchy is a first sign that they've received none. Okay, very quickly, let's go down the table. Uh, well, I, I will say that I don't think all older people are wise. I think lots of children are wise, um, but we, we are experienced, and I think um, 
it's important to, to listen to each other and not allow the, the, the value of a human being to expire over time. It's really the ugly part of ageism. So to, to give equal value to mm -hmm. everyone from you know, from the moment we're born on, because aging is living, aging is moving through life, it is not being sick, it is not dying. So to look at the entire life course and think how we can support learning from each other through contact across the generations. Let's break down age segregation. Let's work on all these causes at all ages and make those efforts intersectional and intergenerational, and that way we'll pass on everything we all know. Well, that one lacks the wisdom of the elders. That was a garbled load of shit about, oh, some old people aren't clever and some young people are clever and um, we could all be clever and learn from one another, even the fucking dumb shits, I'm guessing. Anyway, wisdom of the elders, she definitely doesn't have. And just so you all know, that wasn't short, so my... <laughs> Okay, very I'm, short. I'm just going to tell you what I've learned as I've gotten older because I'm 52 years old. The older I get, the queerer I am. And my partner is a bisexual man. And I'm urging the straight, the cis straight men out there, there is something deeply broken in you and in the way that you move through the world. As you get older, learn from people like us so that this can be a better world. Be queerer. Be more bisexual. <laughs> be less cisgendered in okay. the way that you move through the world. Just Fuck it all up and be free. <laughs> Learn what from you? I just learned that you're getting queerer and your partner is bisexual. Meaning, I'm guessing that you've run out of fucking excitement in life and you're experimenting with your sexualities in order to try and find some. I don't want to learn that. I'm still finding excitement in my life and I'm your age. All I've learned from you is you're a stagnant pool of pond water. Salty old pond, probably with a bad case of crabs, and you've got a desperate need for tadpoles. By the way, is your partner bisexual because he'd like to fuck anything but you? I can't blame him much. Um, well, again, I mean, for me, this is about the contribution of uh, cultural diversity into this conversation. We, um, notwithstanding abuse and violence and, and all the issues we have, um, but we afford absolute dignity and respect and wisdom to ageing populations. So it ties in with the whole conversation around aged care. We only have a single model that is born out of Anglo-Celtic ways of thinking about treating the elderly who are no longer useful in society. So I think it'd be a good idea to consider um, thinking about those who acquired wisdom. Okay. I don't know what she was doing there. Some shit about our aged care system is based in the Anglo. Look, I've seen old people begging on the streets of China. I wonder which system is the better. Uh, but just the same, I think what she essentially told us is she's learned nothing. She really hopes to one day. Throughout life. Nayuka, short answer. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> I just, I spent the day up at Shepparton yesterday and was at Rambalara and I visited some of my old aunties um, there and they were filthy, a lot of sex jokes. Um, but something, yeah, something my auntie Audrey said um, was that you have to laugh. So I think that is something I've been trying to do. Yeah, you got to laugh is a pearl. <laughs> yeah. Great Finally, a little bit of wisdom. And isn't it amazing that the old black ladies can have naughty jokes, but men can't? When we do it, it's sexist. When the old black ladies do it, it's just filthy. They sound like fun people, actually. Now, if only that was the wisdom they passed on. I said, is a pearl. Jess, my, my nonna was my rock and um, she campaigned for the rights of writers. And I, I used to sit at her dining room table and fold leaflets campaigning for the freedom of Ken Sarawiwa, a Nigerian activist and many others. And she taught me, she imbued in me that writing was a way to keep the bastards honest. And so I became a writer. You should become a writer who does research. It's a shame that the grandmother you let down so much in aged care couldn't tell you that do your fucking homework but then you said she was going senile and she sounds like more of a letter writer than an actual writer maybe she had no fucking clue at all another pearl that's all we've got time for tonight can you please thank our panel Ashton Appletite, Mona El Dahawi, Hana Asafiri, Nayuka Gori and Jess Hill thank you for an agonizing week of video production getting through this fucking shit it's all I got. Okay, that was it. That was part three and the entire show covered. I know there was so much more in it that I could have done. Um, but just the same. It is done. I'm not going back. I never want to see it again. Um, I'm going to do something unusual. I'm up to 20 videos, I think, now, somewhere around that, including the introduction. And I think it's about time I finally put out the usual plug everyone does, you know, the sub support, 
tick the button, whatever the fuck you've got to do. You know the stuff. Um, if you feel the urge, can't hurt, can it? I don't know. I don't even know what the next video is at this stage. All I know is my parents are coming tomorrow. It's going to be a couple of days before I get around to producing anything. And that's my four-year-old son who has been told to stay quiet and can't if you're hearing him in the backyard, in the background. Um, anyway, I'm the anti-theocrat. Uh, may your gods remain fictional. I'll see you in the next one.